Hi, I'm Aaron from Living Science Videos. In previous videos, we talked about what some people used to think about what life is and where it comes from. We listed the criteria required to be considered alive, but we didn't really talk about how the first life began or the science behind the origin of life. It is often said that all the conditions for the first production of a living organism are now present which could ever have been present. But if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc. present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. At the present day, such matter would be instantly devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living creatures were formed. Everyone understands that there was once a time when nothing yet lived on this planet, so how did it come about? The short answer is we still don't know exactly how that happened, but that doesn't mean we don't know anything. It's still a puzzle, but we have some of the pieces, enough to know some of the answer. Science can only consider what the evidence indicates, and this is where biology refers to geology. In fact, multiple fields of science overlap to reveal the same pattern. There's a detailed record written in the rocks literally recorded in stone in the many layers of the geologic column. This history of life on Earth has been well established for centuries and is made more robust with every new discovery. We're not just talking about fossils, but trace indications of changing environmental conditions in different periods down through the ages. According to every ounce of paleontological evidence anyone has ever dug up, the further back in time you look, the simpler and more similar living things appear to be in until there are only single cells, and prior to that, there's no evident life of any kind at all. There were no primates 100 million years ago, no mammals 200 million years ago, no dinosaurs 300 million years ago, and no land animals whatsoever 400 million years ago. 500 million years ago, there weren't any insects or vertebrates with actual bones, and 600 million years ago, there weren't even the most primitive fish yet. All there are from back that far are things so bizarre, we don't know what they are. We've never found any trace of fossils for macroscopic life forms prior to 700 million years ago, but we do have bacterial microfossils covering another 2.8 billion years prior to the first multicellular anythings we've ever found a trace of. The only possible conclusion we can draw from all that is that for the first 80% of the history of life on this planet, the most advanced organisms were merely microbes. It is very rare that anything is ever fossilized, and when that happens, it's usually only the hard parts that leave any impression. We can still find tracks and tunnels of worms and that sort of thing, but not everything leaves trace fossils. The smaller it is, the harder it is to leave a recognizable imprint. So if we're talking about single-celled microbes without any bones or shells or teeth, then circumstances have to be perfect, and we'd have to know exactly where to look, or we wouldn't find any trace of them at all. Stromatolites are a notable exception. Some microbes, like cyanobacteria, live in colonies and leave secretions that catch grains of dust and concrete them, eventually building up these large rock-like structures. These account for some of the oldest fossils in the world, dating back 3.5 billion years. Some stromatolite-building microbes use photosynthesis to produce their food, and they can live without oxygen, but they expel oxygen as a waste product, just like plants do today. The abundance of these type fossils all over the world for billions of years before the appearance of multicellular organisms implied that they produced a lot of oxygen, enough to envelop the whole world. Initially, this oxygen was absorbed into the oceans and then into exposed iron on land, turning it into iron ore. But rock layers from 600 million years ago showed that they had finally absorbed all the oxygen they could, and the rest became our atmosphere and our ozone layer relatively quickly. Prior to that, it seems that the atmosphere was made of greenhouse gases that would have been poisonous to us and wouldn't have protected us against solar radiation. However, oxygen is poisonous to most anaerobic organisms, and the new atmosphere would have killed off many primordial life forms. So the world in which life first emerged would have seemed to us like an inhospitable, toxic, volcanic nightmare. It was more chemically active and radioactive, with the moon much, much closer than it is today. It was a much more energetic world, and that may have been the key to cooking up increasingly complex chemicals eventually leading to life. Some people thought that a single experiment could produce life from simple chemicals, but they didn't realize how complex living cells actually are. This would require multiple processes over a series of different stages. 
Some of that happens easily. The ingredients which form the most basic cell structures create a phospholipid bilayer automatically upon contact with water due to their combined polarity. Likewise, the function of enzymes and transport vesicles and all other minuscule but critical elements within a cell all conform to physical properties. But we have to start with the right basic chemicals. In order to show whether life could emerge naturally, scientists first had to show that the environment could have derived complex organic compounds out of relatively simple inorganic ingredients and that this could have happened incidentally within that environment. Stanley Miller and Harold Urey created a sealed artificial atmosphere of water, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen, and they proved that when heated and electronically charged, these would produce amino acids, the building blocks of living proteins. They repeated the experiment with different gases according to different hypotheses for the atmosphere of the prebiotic earth, and all of them produced amino acids. One of these experiments, called the volcano in a bottle, used chemicals common in volcanic eruptions, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and sulfur dioxide. That experiment turned out to produce 22 amino acids and a few other organic molecules. Shortly thereafter, Sidney Fox studied the spontaneous formation of peptides, short chains of amino acid monomers, and he demonstrated that as they dried, they developed into long strings called polypeptides, becoming increasingly complex. Then it was discovered that these could even form in outer space. Fragments of the Murchison meteorite, a 4.5 billion year old chondrite that fell to Australia in 1969, were found to contain a great many different types of as yet unidentified molecules of extreme complexity, in addition to simple organic molecules such as sugars, lipids, and nitrogenous bases. It was also found to contain more than 80 amino acids, some in large amounts. With that established, scientists then had to show how the most important ingredient came about, the extremely complex macromolecule known as DNA. There's another version of genetics called RNA, and activated RNA actually builds DNA. Some viruses don't have DNA, but they do have RNA, and this led many scientists to hypothesize life beginning in an RNA world. RNA and DNA are both made of many times repeated components called nucleotides. It took a while, but researchers have shown how RNA nucleotides could have formed naturally in conditions now expected of the prebiotic Earth. In 2009, organic chemist John Sutherland at the University of Manchester showed how a specific cocktail of relatively simple chemicals became increasingly complex after several cycles of repeated inundation, dehydration, and irradiation. Once the mix became sufficiently complex, after enough repetition, a plausible phosphate was introduced, and the mix spontaneously transformed into ribonucleotides, the precursor of nucleic acids, the building blocks of RNA and DNA. Dr. Sutherland remarked that his laboratory conditions were like the warm little pond which Darwin speculated might be how life first emerged, provided that pond evaporated, got heated, and then it rained, and then the sun shone. Interestingly, the pathway from simple chemistry to complex chemistry to basic biology involves multiple mediums, repeatedly heating and cooling, dousing and drying. This is generally expected to be in solution, optimally uh, near underwater geothermal vents or in volcanic pools near a shoreline. Other scientists had already shown that by dripping solutions of amino acids or RNA nucleotides onto a particular type of clay, it produced polymers. Nucleotide precursors spontaneously assembled into RNA strands, even without the help of enzymes or ribosomes. Another team of researchers at Harvard showed how RNA could even duplicate itself without the normally necessary enzyme. An enzyme is a catalytic molecule which reacts to other molecules performing certain functions. They can metabolize food and digestion, or they can help rapidly replicate macromolecules, or make new copies of RNA. In fact, the enzyme itself is actually made of RNA. When double-stranded RNA is heated and divides, one strand contorts into a ribosome and the other becomes a template to be copied. Within the field of abiogenesis research, also known as prebiotic chemistry, there are literally dozens of concordant hypotheses, almost all of which could be true at the same time. Scientists have even composed protocells with some degree of metabolic processes, something similar to the hypothesized hypercycle. So it seems like the whole hypothesis has already been substantiated, but not quite yet. What I'm saying now is a super simple summary of something that is really crazy complex.
There is still the question of how such protocells would grow and divide without all of the components we know of from modern cells, which of course the most primitive cells might not even need. That and some people want to see the whole collection of processes as a single experiment where basic chemicals are poured in and something like bacteria comes out. We're not quite there yet. But speaking personally, what has always inspired me about science wasn't what was already known, but whatever we still don't know or haven't yet shown. Because that's where new scientists, perhaps even you, might contribute or discover something profound. Thank you.